Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. We've all heard of high-interest savings accounts that we can open up at our bank, but Is that always our one and only best option when it comes to where we keep our short-term cash or for things like our emergency fund or when we are saving for something expensive like a car and we want that money to be available immediately when we need it and not be subject to the sometimes large day-to-day fluctuations that we see in the stock market. In this episode, you are going to learn what your options are here in Canada when it comes to that short-term cash that you want to be readily available without you having to worry about incurring any massive day-to-day fluctuations that you would typically see in the stock portion of your investment portfolio. Today's guest, Matt Montemuro, is going to take us through the different options that we have as Canadians, and he's going to take us through the pros and cons of each of these options so that you can make your own educated decision on which option is the best one for you based on your situation and your risk tolerance. And spoiler alert, the best solution is not always the traditional high interest savings account at your bank. And make sure you stick around because there are actually some regulatory changes happening here in Canada that are going to be impacting high interest savings ETFs. A lot of Canadians have been investing pretty heavily in these, and now it's gone to the point where the regulators have started to take notice, and they are about to implement some pretty significant rule changes that can negatively impact some of your investments if you purchase or are considering purchasing high-interest savings ETFs. So a bit of a background about our guest. Matt is a specialist when it comes to fixed income with over a decade of experience in this field. He is currently the team lead for all fixed income portfolios managed by BMO ETFs, which is the largest Canadian ETF provider. In his role as portfolio manager and trader, Matt and his team are responsible for all segments of the fixed income market, both in Canada and internationally. He holds an HBA and MBA from the Richard Ivey School of Business at the University of Western Ontario and is a CFA charter holder. Definitely a very difficult designation to get. I'm thrilled to have him on the show. And I must say, speaking with him during this interview actually made me reevaluate where I keep my own short-term cash. And I really wish we were all taught this back in school as it's important for us to know what our options are here in Canada, along with the pros and cons of each one, instead of just always automatically defaulting to a regular high interest savings account at our bank. So enjoy the interview. I learned an absolute ton, and I'm sure you will too. Let's get into it. All right, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Cornell. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Matt, the high interest savings account is something that I think all of us have heard of already, and this is often the default choice for many of us when we're saving for something or using it as an emergency fund or as an account that pays for our day-to-day expenses. However, there are also high interest savings ETFs. What is the difference between those and a high interest savings account that we would open up at a bank? Can you take us through the pros and cons of these two options? And why wouldn't someone just put their cash in their existing high interest savings account at their bank? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've definitely seen an increased interest in these uh, high interest savings accounts or HISA ETFs. They've become extremely popular over the last few years. But we've seen significant flows into these ETFs as interest rates have gone up. So investors are getting paid more to sit on the sidelines in cash. So that's a very valuable uh, thing for a lot of investors. So we're seeing a big uptick in the usage of these HISA ETFs. What is a HISA ETF? It's actually an ETF that deposits cash in a portfolio of high interest savings accounts. So literally the underlying portfolio is just a bunch of high interest savings bank accounts. Money within the ETF is aggregated and spread among several different banks often generating a premium yield for investors because of the size of the fund that they have and the relationships that these ETF providers have with the individual banks. The account itself is actually no different than the high interest savings account that you would get from your local branch. The difference lies in a few areas. At your branch, your money is CDIC insured for up to $100,000, where in the ETF, 
each underlying HISA account only provides 100,000 of coverage to the entirety of the ETF structure. So investors are not protected in the same way as they would be if they invested in a branch. So that is an important difference. It's a subtle difference, but it does have a big difference in terms of the insurance on your capital that CDIC provides. So investors should definitely need to know about that. Why do people use or why do investors use HISA ETFs versus a regular HISA? Well, it shows up in your trading account. It shows up on your trading platform. That can be just an easier way to track cash as an asset class rather than kind of moving it to other different areas. It makes it easier. It's tickerized. It makes it look like when you look at your total asset allocation, it makes it seem like it's part of your portfolio rather than a bank account on the side. So optics purposes, we find a lot of investors find it very useful to use the ETF, easy to trade in and out of versus the underlying account. But there are those subtle differences, especially in terms of the insurance that you get provided. And have you found in your experience that the high interest savings account ETF, that those tend to provide higher interest rates than if you were just to go to your typical bank that you already bank with and try to go just use just that one bank for your high interest savings account? Yeah, in general. Is that pretty consistent? Yes, in general. And again, it's just a kind of a scale game. You know, the high interest savings accounts have three billion, five billion in AUM. So when they go to a branch or they go to the bank, the bank wants those deposits. So they pay a premium for them. So in general, uh, there is quite a bit of a premium on the HISA ETF yield versus the traditional HISA yield that you can get from your branch. And then you mentioned the CDIC insurance. So you're not really getting that to that level. Correct. But because that ETF has so many hydro savings accounts in it, you're still, you're basically very highly diversified. And so you're still getting some extra I don't know if security is the right word to use, but you're getting yeah. you know, a little bit decreased risk. You don't have the security or the protection as you would like a traditional high interest savings account. But you, like you said, you are spreading that risk amongst the banks. So if they have mm -hmm. five or seven different high interest savings accounts, you're spreading that individual bank risk across seven different institutions. Now, there seems to be some changes coming up in 2024 when it comes to high interest savings ETFs. Can you take us through what those are and how it will impact us regular Canadian investors. Yeah, absolutely. With the rise of interest in the assets specifically into these HISA ETFs, you know, several market participants began asking questions about the structure and potentially the impact on the overall financial system and the potential risk that they could pose. So OSFI, which is our national financial regulator, began an industry-wide consultation earlier this year in or around April and May to gauge the wide-ranging impact that these ETFs could have on the financial system as a whole. You know, traditionally, uh, a HISA at a bank was seen from a capital perspective as a deposit, uh, making it the most attractive type of capital for a bank as they have the highest ability to lend out those deposits. So when these HISA ETFs came in, several banks viewed these also as deposits. And because it's considered a deposit, banks were almost always, banks are almost always looking to add deposits. They're always looking to lend that money out. It's always a deposit game. You know, they were willing to pay a premium to capture the assets that were sitting in these HISA ETFs. So you're, the investors were getting a premium yield and banks were getting a easy and simple way to get deposits within their structures so that they could lend them out as banks do. And this is why we saw a lot of HISA ETFs paying higher yields than you see in money market or the overnight rate. Because again, essentially banks were willing to pay a premium for those deposits. But here's where the problem comes in. Retail deposits are traditionally very sticky. It's very sticky capital. It's very attractive. And that's why the regulators allow for banks to lend it out. Because generally an individual investor isn't pulling millions of dollars back and forth through these accounts, it's for individual spending. You have some certainty there that the money's going to stay there for some period of time. But as institutional capital started to tr get attracted to these ETFs, there, there began this concern was if an asset manager who manages a $5 billion fund has $500 million in this ETF, they could reallocate that on any given day. And if they pull that, that's much less sticky than we traditionally view a deposit. So that's why OSFI started to look and say, hmm, if IAs and institutions and pensions are using these HISA ETFs, maybe these HISA ETFs aren't as sticky or aren't as deposit-like as we initially thought. 
So throughout this consultation, OSFI wanted to ensure that the banks were properly capitalized and that we weren't inflating deposit numbers, which would potentially create a vulnerability in our financial system. Because again, if you're lending out on a higher percentage, money, this money gets pulled back, all of a sudden the bank or the bank that lent that out would be at a potential shortfall. So what happened on October 31st was OSFI finally came forward and made its decision. And they identified that the assets that are in HISA ETFs should not be considered deposit-like. They should be considered wholesale funding. Uh, and that means that the bank cannot lend that money out like a deposit. And so if it's not going to be considered a deposit, it's less attractive capital for the bank. And the expectation is, uh, implementation date on this is January 31st, but the expectation is that yields are going to come down meaningfully, about 50 basis points on most of these HISA ETFs moving forward. So it sounds like, practically speaking, if I'm an investor that has some of these HISA, so Hydra Savings Account ETFs, I myself, maybe, and other key investors have been kind of flooding to those because they actually provided really, really good rates, essentially. And it's relatively kind of on the safer side as far as investments go. And so they were very attractive. But if I understand you correctly, now things are kind of shifting where we're actually going to likely see a drop in what they are now offering. And so it kind of something that we should, I guess, know about here as Canadians, because if we do have money, if we haven't flooding into this, if we own a bunch, we might see those rates drop significantly. Um, so what are kind of the, did I understand that correctly? And what are the implications for you and me, like a regular, let's say DIY investor? How should we be thinking about this going forward? I think you did a great job of summarizing it there. It's not a liquidity story. The ETFs are going to continue to trade. The investors are, shouldn't be concerned that their capital is going away. It's going to be tied up. That's not what the story is. It is a yield story. So it is for investors if you had income needs and you were using this HISA because it had a 5.5% yield and you needed that 5.5% every month, well, on a go forward basis, that ETF, just using the quick math, will provide 5%. So you may be at a sh yield shortfall on a go forward basis. Also for investors, many of them chose that HISA ETF product because of the yield premium. And now a lot of those HISAs are going to be now yielding less than traditional money market or short-term fixed income. So as an investor, again, if you're aiming to maximize the yield on your cash, you now have two other options that likely will pay a higher yield on a go-forward basis. So as a do-it-yourself investor, you always want to maximize and do what's in your best interest. And if you are looking to maximize the value of that cash or those savings, you know, a high interest savings account may be a little bit less attractive than it once was. So it's kind of like a call to action, I guess, to us Kenya investors who invest in that way through something like a HISA ETF. Exactly. Just think, hey, maybe you should reevaluate to see what's out there again. Yep. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. of these major regulatory changes that are going to probably decrease the rate you're currently getting that you've been getting used to quite significantly. And so it's worth your while to see what else is out there. Other ETFs of comparable risk level, so still kind of on the state or more stable side, uh, but they may actually be giving you higher rates now than what you've been used to on this HISA ETF. Did I some, did I understand that, that correctly? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, yep, awesome. Now, is a consequence of this that we should also expect to see rates offered at banks for high interest savings accounts to drop? Like, if you just go to your regular bank branch, are we going to expect those to drop as well? Do you think because of these rules? You know what? I, I don't I don't think the traditional HISA in a bank branch should impact it in any meaningful way. I think they're going to continue to go. To be honest, if anything, the, there is a potential upside for the traditional HISA holder because if a specific bank is now at a deposit of shortfall, they may want to incentivize individual investors to try to give more in there. So they may have some uh, rates just over the short term. But overall, I don't think the traditional HISA account should be impacted too negatively or positively from the decision. It's going to be more so, you know, I think the uh, those investors who still want that HISA exposure, they may consider moving from the ETF to that, that traditional HISA in, in the bank and get kind of whatever that prevailing rate is, which it depends on your AUM, the type of client you are, the specific bank. That range, it can... It can vary widely as to what you get compensated depending on the market environment as a whole. So yeah, if you're one of the ETF investors, I guess, that were buying these as ETFs and you've been kind of pumping a lot of money into it because of these really attractive rates, 
It's kind of like the party is stopping. <laughs> it sounds like a little bit. It's definitely, and, absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely less it's, attractive as it once was. It's kind of time to go back shopping and see what's what's yeah, out there, what's comparable absolutely. ones are out there. And sure. you know, yeah. at, at the same yeah. time, it's one of those things. I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Investors took advantage of an excellent opportunity. A regulatory change happens. Like you said, now it's time to reevaluate. Is this the product that's going to be for me now going forward? And that's mm-hmm. not a bad thing. You took advantage of the, of an opportunity that was there. Things changed and now it's time to reevaluate. Yeah, the party was good while it lasted. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. All right, I want to give a big shout out to Passive for sponsoring this episode. They are free to use and are literally the number one tool that I consistently use to manage all my investments. If you've been investing for any period of time, you know how important rebalancing your portfolio is as that's what allows you to consistently buy low and sell high with your investments, as well as ensure that you aren't taking on any additional unnecessary risk. Now, as critical as rebalancing your portfolio is, it's actually a manual and annoying labor-intensive process as to do it correctly, you have to log into each of your household's investment accounts and do manual data entry on a spreadsheet to figure out how much to buy of each investment every single time that you have money to invest. And there's always the chance that you make a mistake and miscalculate something when doing it yourself on a spreadsheet. So these days, when I have money to invest, I simply log into Passive, I immediately see what I'm holding too much and too little of in my portfolio, and Passive automatically calculates how much I need to buy of each ETF to get me back to my target across all of my household's accounts. Then in a couple of clicks, I can have passive buy the investments that I'm holding too little of across all my and my wife's accounts without me having to log in and out of each account to manually do the trades myself. I'm also able to see how my entire household's investment portfolio is doing across all our accounts in just a mouse click instead of manually having to add everything up across all my accounts. So they have a free account that you can use to try them out. And if you are a Quest Trade user like me, you also get their premium account for free. So it's a complete no-brainer. And I've personally been using them for years at this point. So I can definitely vouch for them as they have literally become my number one favorite tool for managing my investments. They saved me many dozens of hours when I'm managing and optimizing my portfolio. So definitely check them out. They are a fantastic Canadian company and you can get your free account by going to Build Wealth Canada dot ca slash free again that's buildwealthcanada.ca slash free and now back to the show um, now for those of us that do invest in high interest savings etfs can we expect a drop in those etfs coming january 2024 because of a potential sell-off so like you mentioned that the, you can expect the yield to go down the interest that we're getting but i'm guessing investors are hearing this news there's a ton of key investors who have been buying these etfs now they're hearing about this change i imagine this is the kind of thing that can cause a sell-off. Can we expect the pricing of those to drop as well, the way it would for like a stock, for example, when it gets some bad news? I, I think you're still going to see the stability of the NAV, just given what the underlying is. It's still a savings account. So there's actually not going to be much market impact, whether if you go and redeem, they basically go in and they take money out of the account and they send it to you. So while you may see AUM go down and you will see the net, the yield go down, the likelihood of the NAV going down is very low. You're still going to gotcha. see that same stability because at the, at the end of the day, the ETF is just going to represent what that underlying asset class is, like you said, like a stock. But the underlying asset class here is literally uh, cash that is not locked up. So when you want to get your $100 out, they just go and they grab $100, take it out, and they, they send it to you. So there shouldn't be much a, a, an impact on the NAV performance. It's more mm-hmm. so on a go-forward yield uh, performance or go-forward yield that, that will be impacted. Can you define what NAV is and what AUM is just for anybody that's new to all the terminology? Yeah, absolutely. So NAV is the net asset value. So basically, it is the prevailing market value that is snapshot at the end of every day of every ETF and mutual fund in Canada. That it basically values all of the HISAs within the HISA ETF will get valued at a specific price. And that will be then then roll up on a pro rata basis to the NAV of the fund, whether it's a mutual fund or an ETF. And AUM is assets under management. And basically it is the, the amount of money that is within an ETF. It's the amount of assets or money, how big that ETF is. 
So when I'm saying we've seen a lot of inflows, money has been coming into the ETF. And if we expect money to come out because of the yield drop, you're going to see it go down and money to come out of the ETF. But I mean, from an investor perspective, I guess like a regular DIYK investor, the main, it sounds like the main thing that would impact us is just, look, we're getting, we're getting a much lower interest rate essentially on our investment now. Uh, and that's kind of the primary concern and why you're basically prompting us to reevaluate our options uh, when it comes to this type of investment. In our exactly. Portfolio. I don't see it yeah. as a negative driver in performance. It's, a, it's more of an opportunity cost. And can you maybe speak a little bit about when it comes to sell-offs and ETFs? And I know you just, you explained it really well with the HISA ETFs, but I realize this also applies to other types of ETFs. Like there's a lot of total market passive index investors that listen to this show. And when we hear about, let's say there's a company and you bought a stock and there's some really bad news, like let's say there's been fraud or something like that, then okay, there's a sell-off of that stock and we see the, the price plummet, right? This is mm -hmm. the kind of typical thing. But with ETFs, especially like these total market, you know, passive index ETFs, it's a bit of a different animal, right? With the way that it works, it's not like all of a sudden people are going to, even if people start massively selling it, it's not like it's going to plummet in the same way that an individual company stock would. Can you speak to that a little bit just so that we understand the difference so that we don't have people thinking, okay, in the future, if something happens with some specific ETF that, oh, there's a sell-off, it's going to go down to zero and then we lose all our money. Yeah. So, and, and I think that's the benefit of the passive investing and the, you know, the ETF as a whole. It's diversification you are not taking specific single stock risk. You are diversifying that across, you know, depending on the strategy, let's call it the S&P 500, 500 different names. So if one of those companies, you know, let's say goes to zero, you know, you're not going to see your portfolio go to zero. You're going to see 1% of that portfolio drop to zero. But over as a whole, you're going to have that diversified away. So you're diversifying away individual company specific risk and you're taking on total market risk as a whole. And what that allows you to do is protect yourself on the downside from those type specific events. And over the long term, it's shown that passive investing and asset allocation is, are the main drivers of long-term performance, not stock selection. So mm -hmm. that's where you still experience that loss, but it's just across so many different line items and names or stocks that that specific risk gets diversified away to a very, very small portion of the portfolio's return. Now, how is a high interest savings ETF different from a money market ETF? Can you take us through the pros and cons of those? Because you mentioned that's one of the alternatives to these HISA ETFs is a money market ETF. So what's, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to share my screen here, just show kind of, you know, this is our money market ETF, ZMMK. And this is the, the main difference here is that, you know, like I said, the HISA ETF literally invests or deposits money into high interest savings account where something like ZMMK, which is a, uh, which is a money market ETF, invests in securities, but they're ultra short-term securities. So these are short-term bonds. These are Canadian T-bills. These are bankers' acceptances, commercial paper, all of which have a very, very short term, but very, very high quality. So what a money market fund is supposed to do is supposed to be an, an ability for investors to equitize their cash. So get a return from those cash balances and take on very, very low risk. So you can see over here on the credit allocation, you know, you're getting A rated and above. So extremely high quality. Generally, the exposure is like banks. That's kind of 90% of the, of the exposure here is bank exposure. Uh, and you're getting a very low term to maturity and duration. So you're limiting your interest rate sensitivity because the, the overall duration of these debt instruments or money market instruments are less than about, it's about 40 days. So you're limiting your interest rate exposure. You're taking advantage of an additional yield due to the credit exposure that you're taking on from the banks. And you're providing, again, a very, very stable return over the long term. So you can see this return chart here. Basically, from December 30th, it is just a straight line up, and that is just the yield. You're providing a very, very similar exposure to a HISA, except you're doing it in a different way. You're using money market securities, so that's kind of ultra short-term fixed income securities, versus using high interest savings accounts. Very interesting. Yeah, I think there's definitely many investors who they might do equities or equity ETFs, asset allocation ETFs, things of that nature. 
but then they want to have some money it's kind of set aside right yeah, for, for that sure. safer Porsche portfolio non-volatile that kind of a thing and so the default I'm sure for a lot of Canadians is just a high interest savings account at their bank yep. and people you know shop around and they try to get the banks and the banks compete to try to you know do different promotions like oh for three months you get this rate or that rate that kind of a thing yep. but one of the things that we, yeah, we really wanted to cover today was that that's not really your only option in Canada. Absolutely. And so, of course, the second one, like we already talked about, were these the high interest savings account ETFs. Yep. But then this is, a, I guess, option number three now that we're talking about, which is the money market ETFs, which now is not just, they're not just doing hisas, they're doing these other assets. And yeah. one more thing, and traditionally in the asset management side, on the institutional side, asset managers have cash sitting on the sidelines all the time. And generally, the, all that cash sits in the money market accounts of all the different asset managers. So this has been an institutional tool for a long time. And just ETFs have now allowed those same funds to be available to the do-it-yourself investors. So, you know, I understand high interest savings accounts. When they were paying a higher premium, it made sense to put it in there. But now on a go-forward basis, we expect money market funds to be about a 30 basis point yield premium to nice. many of those hisses. So for investors, you can say, okay, you know, maybe I'll do what those asset managers do and I'll just buy a money market fund. So I think that's the trade-off that they can look at. Awesome. And then for everybody that's just listening, if you do want to follow along and you want to see what Matt's talking about, you can just Google ZMMK and then space BMO. It's, it's a BMO ETF and that will take you to the, it should be the first result. Also, what I'm going to do is create uh, like a pretty link that you can easily follow along. So if you just go to buildwealthcanada.ca slash Z. M M K. I'll make it so that that when you go there, it just automatically redirects you to this page. But then this is also going to be on YouTube. So if you want to, you know, if you're listening right now through a podcast player, you can check it on YouTube as well to see it, or you can just go to those links that I just said, and you can kind of see what we're talking about as one of the other options when it comes to this part of your portfolio or you know cash holdings that kind of a thing. Um, awesome, Matt. Thank you. Oh, happy to. So we talked about how this money market or these money market ETFs how they compare to Hissa ETFs. Can we now talk about comparing them to, I would say, the traditional option for the everyday Canadian, which is just a regular high interest savings account at a bank? What are the pros and cons of you know doing something like this money market ETF or you know one, ones comparable to this versus just you know going to your bank or signing up for a new bank account to get some you know promotional rate uh, at a at a bank that's offering like a, maybe a comparable interest rate for a limited time? Yeah, I think it's the scalability of it, the ease to to be able to, you know, have it in your trading account. So, you know, a lot of the time, if it's not just purely for savings, if it's part, if it's part of your investment portfolio, it's nice to have everything in one place. And you know, I understand sometimes going to the different banks and getting that promotional rate. You're now you're constantly adding different things, and you're adding another fund, yeah. and you're adding a username, and you're right, and you got to go in there, and you got to maybe you have an Excel spreadsheet that that aggregates it, but you now you have to go in. I think one of the benefits of using an ETF is it streamlines the process. It's a, it's a single sheet on your on your trading account. You can look and say, okay, here's how much I own. Here's the cash. Here's the, the distribution comes out on a specific date. That's the cash that I've earned that specific day. Uh, and I think that's really made investors' lives a lot easier. It's not just the process of going out and having to open that account. I know a lot of them now can, you can do it online, but it's... Oh, keeping the usernames, making sure that you're you're following up with those promotional periods, if it's three months, six months, nine months, whatever that may be, making sure that you're meeting all those targets where in many cases, this ZMMK, because it is a premium over the overnight rate, is paying a similar, if not higher yield than a lot of these promotional targets. So it can save the do-it-yourself investor time, effort, and often confusion. You know, not, you don't need to have 12 bank cards. Every, everything can be in one place if you're, if you're using EFs. Mm -hmm. I like that because, I mean, let's say you get your paycheck, you put a portion of it towards yep. savings, uh, your discount brokerage, whoever you use, and then you can look in there, like you said, everything's there holistically, and you can decide, okay, I'm going to take X percent of that, let's say put it into like an asset allocation ETF, but oh, my emergency fund's getting a bit low because something happened, you know, the car broke down last week or whatever, yep. and so, okay, I'm going to kind of top it up, and so I'm going to take a portion of that and pump it into like a money market ETF like this, for example. And so now you can kind of manage things that way all in one spot. So yeah, I could see the appeal of that for sure. Absolutely. Very interesting. One thing that I did just in preparation for this interview is I kind of did my own research as well, just to see what are the pros and cons of using like a traditional high interest savings account at a bank versus something like what you're talking about, where you're buying an ETF instead. Uh, and so 
I was hoping to get your input just in case maybe I misinterpreted something just to kind of get all the pros and cons out there as well. And so one thing that I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is I went to a website, it's called highinterestsavings.ca. And what they do for everybody listening, we've talked about on the show before, they basically look at a whole bunch of different banks in Canada and in the table, they put out what interest rates they are currently offering under high interest savings accounts. So it's a really quick way for you. I'm not affiliated with them or anything like that. This is just a useful tool that I heard about, but it's a nice kind of tool where you can quickly see in a table, okay, what are these different banks offering in Canada? Who's got the highest rate? Who's got the lowest? Maybe you know, you're with a bank currently and it turns out they're like the lowest stock, you know, the ones with the lowest rate, yep. that kind of a thing. So when I look at that, like as of, I checked this a few days ago, the rate ranged depending on the bank from 2.25% to 4%. Uh, so that was kind of what I saw there. And then when I compared it to ZMMK, which is the one you were just talking about, the ETF, I'm seeing an average weighted yield to maturity of 5.29%. So like significantly higher. Yep. Now, is question for you, is the weighted yield to maturity, is that the right metric that I should be looking at? Or should I be looking at annualized distribution yield instead? And for anybody that's maybe new to all this, if you just go on the page that we were just talking about, you basically see those two numbers there. And so I'm just curious, Matt, which one should investors be looking at when they're trying to compare you know, going with a hundred savings account at a bank versus something like this, like a money market ETF? Yeah. So that yield to maturity is going to be your go forward expected return. So if you look at a year, nothing changes in a year, you would earn that 5.29%. Mm -hmm. The distribution yield is what you're actually been paid out in your pocket. So generally, the difference between the distribution yield and the yield to maturity is the fee that you're paying for the ETF or the fund. So, you know, for investors, it is important to, to understand what, what you're paying for that fee, what you're paying for that fund, what that fee is and what that impact is. So for example, for ZMMK, the fee is 14 basis points. So your distribution yield, you're going to see on average over the course of the year will be 14 basis points less than that five point, current 5.29%. So investors mm -hmm. should look at both, um, but I think it's important to know what you're going to actually get in your pocket, and that's what distribution yield is going to tell you. Now, is there also something there in regards to capital gains as well because the ME because the spread between 5.29 and 4.93 is bigger than the MER that ZMMK charges right so there's still a bit there extra yeah the big difference is the the uh, um the distribution yield is backward looking where yield to maturity is forward looking that will that distribution yield will start to creep up so what we've seen is so rates have gone up a little bit recently so ZMMK's yield has popped a little bit and that distribution yield will start to creep up as we see monthly distribution. So basically, next month, you're going to see a distribution in ZMMK. That's going to be a little bit higher than the 4.93%. And that's oh, why you're okay. going to be looking forward. So it's kind of one's a backward looking measure, one's a forward looking measure. And you can kind of look and see what direction you expect that distribution yield to go. So in this case, because the gap is higher, you should expect that distribution yield to move up over the next few months. Very interesting. So if you were just like a regular Canadian that's not in the industry and you are you go on the site, this highinterestsavings.ca and you say, you see, oh, okay, the bank that's offering the highest interest rate right now on a regular traditional savings account is 4%. And then you look at something like ZMMK and in that case, would you look at the weighted yield to maturity? So the 5.29, is that what you would compare to do apples to apples? So just for your regular do it yourself, you know what? I think you should look at the distribution yield Okay. as what to be apples to apples. Because when you're looking at a high interest savings account at a branch, that is net of any fees. So the way to make it apples to apples would be look at look to look at that distribution yield. And then mm -hmm. the one thing that it's nice to see is that if you see that yield to maturity being a wider gap or bigger differential than the fee, you can expect mm -hmm. that there's going to be actually upward appreciation nice. in terms of that distribution. So it's actually something not not bad to look at because if you see yeah. it actually very close, you may think, oh, actually, you know what? This distribution yield is going to have to come down. So, you know, that might be something part of your decision-making process as well. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah, because I mean, even just looking at the actual numbers, if the highest rate right now on a regular high interest savings account is, let's say, 4%, like when I checked it a few days ago, and then even if we're using the lower numbers, so the annualized distribution yep. yield, that's 4.93. So, I mean, you're getting almost a percent more yep. by choosing to go with a money market ETF like this as opposed to going with a, just going with a bank, yep. or not a bank, sorry, uh, like a hundred savings account at a, at a typical bank. And like you were saying, 
if I understood you correctly, there's upward pressure that you're actually going to get a little bit more than that probably going forward because looking forward, the weighted yield to maturity is 5.29. Did I understand that correctly? Correct. Yeah, you, yeah, I think that was that's perfectly the correct way to analyze it. And I think one of the that's one of the reasons why we've seen that uptick of interest in those HISA ETFs because they are providing or they were providing a, a meaningful gap in yield and much higher yield than the traditional banks would on an individual account level. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. There are so many opinions on how to invest your money today, but it can be hard to find credible voices to rely on in the world of finance and investing. One resource that I turn to every week is the ETF Market Insights YouTube channel led by today's episode sponsor, BMO ETFs. Market Insights brings in industry experts and the weekly episodes cover the hottest themes like inflation, infrastructure, healthcare, and more. Tuning in helps me stay up to date on what's happening so I can be a smarter investor. And you can also submit your own ETF questions to be answered on the show. So do yourself a favor and subscribe on YouTube to ETF Market Insights or visit ETFMarketInsights.com so you can be notified when future episodes go live. And now back to the show. And I mean, every once in a while, I mean, you've seen this, right? Banks come around and they'll say, hey, yeah. we'll give you five and a half percent, but only for three months. Yeah. And then, you know, and then after that, it drops to something crazy low. At least that's, that's been my experience. Yeah. And <laughs> so they, I don't yeah, even play again, that game they, anymore. They, you know, I, like yeah. I said, the reason why they looked at it was they know that if you, they can get you in the door, if they get those deposits in the door, that they are sticky. So, you know, banks, you know, banks know what they're doing. And I think that's, yeah. that's part of it. We're saying, you know, the, you opening up the account, you bringing it over the likelihood of you keeping it here for a meaningful period is, uh, is high. Yeah. And I mean, I really like as well how this is just the rate. It's not like, it's not some temporary promotion. Yep. You don't have to go to open up an account, which is such a pain. Yeah, Like, absolutely. well, the security, yep. another password to remember. And then the, the, again, going back to like the pros of doing an ETF instead is that it's just, you don't have to worry about like then closing the account because maybe you just did it for the promotion. You went through all that work. And now they bring you back to some really low rate. Now you want to close the account. So that's a pain as well. That's now more hour, like time you have to devote. And there might actually be account closure fees as well. So that's like another thing that someone that, that you could get charged by an institution as well, um, as opposed to just buy the ETF. And then you're basically set. You don't have to play these games of, yep. oh, how long is the promotion for? Oh, did I? The other thing is like all the fine print, right? Where it's like you, you see at the bottom, like, oh, you got to hold it for this amount. Got to do this. Got to do that. You got to transfer you do, this balance it. and keep it in for, oh. you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's it's painful, right? So yeah. th this way, it's like you just, you buy the ETF, like you buy your Asagish ETF, and then you're done. You don't have to play these games and waste your time with them. So that's really, really cool. Um, I really like it. And I do like my kind of last benefit that I found was that it does, it, it's also very liquid. And I know a hundred savings account is liquid as well. Yep. But again, if you're going with one of these promotions, like I know there was one that was pitched to me recently where it's like, yeah, you get this really good rate, but you've got to keep it in there for three months. So it's like, yeah, it's a hundred savings account, but it's kind of working like a GIC now because my money is basically locked in there if I want to have that higher rate. Uh, and so again, now if I need that money because my car broke down or my roof is leaking and it's December, okay, well, uh, now if I take the money out, I'm not going to get that rate anymore. Whereas again, with something like a money market ETF, like what you're showing us here, you don't have to, again, play these games about, oh, did I meet the conditions of the promotion? You just, oh, yeah. you just get full, that by default. Full daily liquidity. Whenever you need it, you can take it out. You hit the sell button and you have it. Yeah. And you're right. Because all of a sudden you don't know, you think, oh, of course, I'm going to have my money in there for 90 days. And you have a, a tree hits your car and now you need to take it at 60 days. And they take away any yeah. sort of the interest. And all of a sudden you just wasted 60 days. You don't have you know, that prorated yield. So definitely something to consider there. Sure. Yeah, I just I hate reading all that legal print. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, it's, it's just it's painful. <laughs> so don't have to deal with that. Yeah. That alone is a, is a benefit. And then and then you know remembering it so that you don't mess it up and then you don't get the promo rate anymore. Okay, so those are the the pros that I had. Is there any ones that you'd add, or do you think we we covered all the? the no, I think you, I think you did a great job uh, of covering it. Okay, and then let's quickly talk about the the cons. So the negatives of doing something like a money market ETF or a Hissa ETF versus like a traditional one at a bank. So some of these we already talked about. So the CDIC insurance you already talked about. So we won't go into that since you explained that already. The other one I would say is trading commissions. Yep. But that one really depends on the brokerage that you're, the discount brokerage that you're using. 
because some let you buy and sell for free. Um, some of them will charge you like five to ten dollars per trade. So you know, if you're gonna put fifty bucks in a money market ETF, then it's probably not worth your while. Um, especially if you're paying five to ten bucks per trade. Um, but a lot of discount brokerages they do offer a commission free trades as well. So this is not really a big negative, I would say. And then the last thing that I'll mention, which we talked about already a little bit, is the MER. So you are gonna get charged an MER. But I did look into it and I did want to highlight that it's not some massive amount either. Um, and the way that I've kind of been looking at it is it's kind of like a convenience fee of <laughs> like, okay, I don't have to open these accounts and you, you bank account to get the higher rate. I don't have to play these games and promotions and stuff, but there's a little bit of an MER that I have to pay. So I looked at ZMMK and I looked at the MER that you guys charge. And on $1,000, the annual fee would be $2.80. Um, so it's a very like a lot of ETFs. the The fee is very little for for what you're getting. So it's not like a you're, you're not getting charged like two and a half percent or something like that. You know, like some of the mutual funds that we've heard about. And on ten thousand dollars, it was twenty eight dollars a year. So, um, so I think that is uh, just again, it's it's something to know. But I don't think that that's something that I mean, at least for me personally, that would not sway me to not want to do it. Because, oh, there's an MER. It's like, well, it's not a huge amount anyway. Yep. And again, Do you have anything to add? Or and anything? you can use that distribution yield, as we talked about, as a way to say, am I getting compensated for that fee? Right? So if you're looking just at a yield to yield level, even if you're talking about a fee, if you're still getting 4.93% versus 4%, you're still coming out on top, regardless of if you've paid an MER or not. Yeah, I think that's a great synopsis of both of them. The other thing to just remember, I, I would say just, and this is the same for both Money Market and for Hissa products, is if it is in a non-registered account, that is going to be taxed as income. So it tends to right. be the most punitive type of taxation. So always something to remember because it's not just, you know, if it's a registered account, don't worry about it. Great. But if it's a non-registered, it's important where you own these assets and kind of what you expect. So you know, know that that's going to be coming as income and that's going to be the most, the highest tax rate that you're going to be paying is, is on that interest income that you earn. And that'll mm -hmm. be both a HISA and a GIC and a HISA ETF will all be 100% yeah. interest income as a, from a return perspective. So it's not, this is not, that's what you just said is not really a, a con or negative. Yeah, it's, it's for every market it, yeah, or HISA exactly. ETFs. It's, it's literally just, it's a type of investment where even if you have a traditional HISA high interest savings account at a regular bank, Exactly. All in that one account, you're still going to get charged. It's, it's going to count fully as income as well. So Correct. like you can't really, if you want to get away from it, you got to put in your TFSA, yeah. but then it's like, do you want to? Because that's where your equities like to go. And be, that's a whole nother topic. But exactly. <laughs> I, I, hear, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that just so yeah, there's no surprises come tax time uh, as well. But yeah, if but whether, like you said, no matter which of the three options we talked about you choose, they're all pretty much getting taxed the same way, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So for something like a money market ETF like ZMMK or a high interest savings ETF, would you expect the capital gain to be zero because everything from that investment is coming in as income in the form of interest? Yes. Okay. Basically for both of those, I would have the expectation that both would be 100% income and not to have any expectation of capital gain. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Just, just so people yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> know what to expect, yeah, right? It's absolutely. like, okay, I'm not going to be seeing 10% growth or something, yep. but I'm going to be getting this, basically this yield coming in like as cash. Correct. Yeah, gotcha. And ZMMK, how often does it pay out? A month. Just curious. Once a month. month. Okay, very cool. So just like a high interest savings account exactly. at a bank or whatever. Yep. Gotcha. While we are on the subject of ETFs that we can use for that relatively safe portion of our portfolio, can you speak to using ultra short-term bond ETFs instead of a money market ETF like the ZMMK that we just talked about, what are these ultra short-term bond ETFs? And what are the pros and cons of using those versus something like a money market ETF, or even instead of just using a high interest savings account at our current bank? I think the a lot of investors are right now, just especially with the OSFI decision, are considering what's next? What do I want to do? So I think one of the questions they should ask themselves is, how much do I want to maximize yield from a safety perspective? to a yield perspective, where do you want to be? And I think something like ZMMK or a HISA ETF, they're on the lower end of the risk scale. That's going to be extremely low risk, low volatility. You're getting your yield and that's what it is. But there are investors who are saying, you know what? I'm willing to take a little bit more risk. It's not a lot more risk. It's a little bit more risk for potentially a lot more yield. So something like ZST invests in under one year corporate bonds. 
And these are all 100% issued in Canada, Canadian corporations. About 60% of the portfolio is in bank bonds. So you're getting exposure to the five or six biggest banks in Canada and their bonds that all mature within a year. So from a credit risk perspective, you're getting a very high quality portfolio, but you're taking advantage of the corporate spread. So the benefit of owning corporate bonds versus, let's say, government is that additional yield that you can earn. So investors who are looking for more yield can look at something like ZST, which has a yield of about 5.6%, as a yield to maturity of 5.6%. So, you know, in terms of versus ZMMK, so ZMMK is 5.29. So you're getting, you know, an, an additional 30 plus basis points. You know, if you look at those HISA ETFs that are going to be around 4.8 or 4.9 post January 31st, um, you're going to get, uh, you know, an additional almost 100 basis points now of additional yield using a short-term fixed income product like ZST. Again, extremely high quality, but it's for these more yield-hungry investors. And so that's something that we, we've seen a lot of investors look to sh alter short-term bonds uh, as a way to get that extra yield from the portfolio. But we talked about taxes, and this is something that I think ZST is unique versus the other two. Because 2022 is such a challenging year in the markets, we saw bonds, we saw interest rates spike up and we saw bond prices come down, right? They're inversely related. So because of, because of that paradigm, uh, most of the bonds in the fixed income market are trading at a discount to par. So that means they're trading under $100. And let's remember, when a bond matures, it matures at $100. So if a bond is trading below $100, within that year, it's going to move up to $100. So what this product does, it gives you that yield premium, but it also combines income and capital gain to your return. And so for taxable investors, I'll show it here on the screen. If you compare this to a HISA, you're getting a significant after-tax difference because, again, your interest income, the coupon that you earn, is much lower because these bonds are trading less than par. And so what you do is you get, you pay income on that coupon portion, and then you have the differential between yield to maturity and coupon, and that's going to be capital gains. So whereas a HISA and a GIC is all interest, this is combining interest income and capital gains. Capital gains are taxed more favorably than income. And that in just this example alone, just that alone is puts 1.09% additional return or yield in an investor's pocket by choosing ZST, using ultra short-term bonds versus uh, something like a HISA or a GIC or a money market fund. So again, it's something that investors should be aware of. Again, is more for the investors who are willing to take a little bit more credit risk. I wouldn't say a lot, but a little bit more credit risk because you are invest bonds and not just accounts and money market securities. But from an after-tax perspective, you know, investors can get a significant a premium after-tax return relative to those HISA ETFs, uh, more than a percent more in your pocket for those taxable investors. So it sounds like you're getting kind of a dual benefit. Benefit one being... Absolutely. You're, it's, it's corporate bonds. And so you're going to be getting, it's a bit higher risk, but therefore you're getting a bit of a higher um, yield from that. Yep. And then there's also the tax advantage as well that you talked about, just because of the current state of the market and where things are now with the discount bonds. Did I understand that correctly? Absolutely. You're getting that additional yield, which is great. But again, you're also taking advantage of the current market dynamics uh, to really uh, benefit from that. And then you talked about corporate bonds and the common thing is that, okay, if you're going into corporate bonds instead of like just sticking with government bonds, let's say you're now going to be enduring some more risk. For something like this, how big of a risk is it? it what's kind of the worst case scenario for something like this? Yeah. So, you know, there, there's always risk when you're investing in corporate bonds, but again, it is a very high quality portfolio. So again, you're, you're, you're investing in Canadian banks, a bank debt that matures in one year. So your main risk here is does, do any of the five big Canadian banks default? Yeah. <laughs> do they go bankrupt within one year? And I think mm -hmm. that's where it's like, okay, you know what? Is it possible that in 30 years they do? Okay. Things can happen. But within a year, it would have to be a very, very serious situation for yeah. any sort of event where all the banks, and in this case, in terms of March 2020, you know, it's probably one of the worst credit events that we've seen in the last 10 years since 09, right? In 08, 09. And we saw very, very little volatility in ZST. 
We saw no defaults out of anyone in the portfolio, only a single downgrade. And again, that bond easily matured. It was just Ford Credit Canada. So, you know, a little bit of a blip down, but again, still matured at 100. So you have this built-in safety net because these bonds are so short, which means that they mature within a year, that as long as these banks, our big banks, aren't going bankrupt in a year, investors are going to be protected on the downside. And for something like ZST, so that's a BMO ETF, but does that hold bonds? It holds bonds from yes, other banks a- as well absolutely. in Canada. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. So we have all uh, representation across all the banks. Okay. We do have diversification across sector as well. We have Bell Canada bonds. We have Rogers. You have TELUS. So it is a diversified exposure, but the main part of it is kind of the Canadian financial system. The Let's call it the big six banks plus a couple other players are in there as well. And I noticed with ZST in particular, when I was looking at your website, you also have ZST.L, which yes. I guess is a variation of ZST. What is the difference between the two? Yeah, so it's actually, a, it's a very unique product. So when uh, ZST, similar to ZMMK and the HISSAS, pays out a distribution monthly. So every month, cash is literally paid to investors and it goes from an investment in ZST to cash in their account. Well, ZST.L, basically created what a drip would be, a dividend reinvestment plan for for a mutual fund where it reinvests that distribution into more shares of the of the ETF. So for investors who are not looking for a cash or income paid out to them on a regular basis, they can use zst.l as a way to just remain invested and then say, "Okay, great. I earned my distribution this month." let's call it whatever, six cents or 20 cents a share. I'm going to just reinvest that in the fund because I just want to keep earning yield on it. So it's really a solution for investors who don't need the cash every month, but want to kind of continue to get be invested in the market. The benefit of it from a do-it-yourself investor, that reinvestment, there's no transaction costs on it. It just automatically goes in and you'll see it in your NAVs, in your net asset value and your performance of the fund. So that's, that's excellent because in terms of what you said, some people are paying commissions on trades. When you have this automatic, you don't have to take that cash and then go out and spend, spend your money on a commission to buy more shares of the ETF. The ETF does it for you. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I could see it being good for even just the everyday Canadian for, let's say, their emergency fund. Yeah. That's, you're not using that for groceries. It's for emergencies. So you don't really necessarily want that cash because now you've got to go wait till it builds up, then you buy in some more of that ETF. Yep. Instead, just have it automatically reinvest and then you can sell it whenever right, if you need it and then you're done. So it's kind of a way to automate things, it sounds like. Very Absolutely. Cool. Exactly. Very, very neat. All right, Matt. Well, well, thanks so much for training on this. This is really good. It's, again, something that I think we should all be learning in school. And I appreciate you coming on and, and teaching us about this. And for everybody that wants to learn more, what's the best place for them to go? Is there somewhere we can see more of your work or check out the ETFs? Anything at all, just tell us yeah, where we can yeah, see more. Yeah, you can more. go to bmoetfs.com. It has our entire product suite. We have tons of educational materials for investors that can go on. You know, if you want to learn about the one, two, threes of, uh, of ETFs, if you want to get in depth on certain strategies, Something like ZST or ZMMK, we go into in depth into what each of the funds holds, how they work. You know, we have lots of educational materials, to, regardless of your aptitude or your uh, skill level. You can use our website as an educational portal as well. So, you know, please go to our website. Thank you for the time. I know it's, uh, you know, it's a unique time in the market, but it's uh, it's great to be able to talk to you and kind of walk through some of the even regulatory changes that we're seeing. When you you see those headlines. Sometimes it's like, what does this mean? What does it mean to me? So I appreciate you giving me the time, Cornell, to, to walk through it and to talk to your audience. Yeah, it, it's been great. I mean, like you said, the regulatory changes definitely is a big prompt, I think, for us Canadians to start thinking about this some more. And it's really nice to know that there are multiple options when you're thinking about this. It's not just like you have to go with your Hydra Savings account at your local bank. There are other options. Each option has its pros and cons. And so you can kind of fine tune for your particular situation. Uh, and I appreciate you. I mean, I know you guys have these ETFs at BMO, but the things you taught us today, you can apply really no matter what kind of ETF Absolutely. you own. Um, so this is really good transferable knowledge no matter what. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, and yeah, thanks. It's been great. That's great. No, thank you. And let me know when I can come on again. Sounds good. Oh, by the way, I should mention to the audience as well, 
you were on ETF Market Insights the other day as well. I was. And the recording of that is already posted uh, on YouTube. So if you search ETF Market Insights, you'll see Matt on there. And he was covering this subject there as well. Uh, so if you would definitely encourage everyone to check it out. It's a popular topic these see days. It. Uh, yeah, I heard it was one of your most popular episodes. So this is definitely <laughs> top of mind for Canadians. I'm glad you guys are covering this so well. So yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for now. All right, take care. Bye. All right, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please share it with someone that you think may find it useful. And of course, leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify is always super appreciated as well. I'd like to end with a big thanks to two of our sponsors who, apart from my investing course, literally keep the entire Build Wealth Canada podcast and website free for you. Our first sponsor is BMO ETFs. Do you know why asset allocation ETFs have become so popular? Asset allocation explains over 90% of the variation in the portfolio's quarterly returns. So it's no wonder Canadian investors are turning to these ETFs. Today's sponsor, BMO ETFs, offers these innovative all-in-one solutions with the BMO All Equity ETF, ZEQT, BMO Growth ETF, ZGRO, BMO Balanced ETF, ZBAL, BMO Conservative ETF, ZCON, and more. BMO developed these to help provide investors with ETFs that offer broad diversification, and they're also low-cost and simple to use. These ETFs invest in a number of underlying index-based ETFs and are rebalanced automatically back to your set asset allocation or mix of stocks and bonds. They offer a hands-free approach to investing that is built on disciplined weights to provide exposure to different geographies and sectors all in one solution. BMO actually offers eight asset allocation ETFs and you can learn more at BMOETFs.com. I'd also like to thank Passive, the investing tool that I use for my entire investment portfolio. You can get your free account in Passive over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash free. And you can see my portfolio and what ETFs I buy within Passive over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash portfolio. Passive is literally the number one tool that I consistently use to manage all my investments as it lets me immediately see what I'm holding too much and too little of in my portfolio. And it automatically calculates how much I need to buy of each ETF to get me back to my target asset allocation across all my household's accounts. Then if I want, in a couple of clicks, I can have passive buy the investments that I'm holding too little of across all my and my wife's accounts without me having to log in and out of each account to manually do the trades myself. My other favorite feature is to be able to see the performance of my entire household's investment portfolio across all our accounts in just a mouse click instead of manually having to add everything up across all our accounts just to see how we're doing. They have a free account that you can use to try them out. And if you are a Quest Trade user like me, you can also get their premium account for free. So it's a complete no brainer. And I've personally been using them for years at this point. So I can definitely vouch for them as they have literally become my number one favorite tool for managing my investments, as they've saved me dozens of hours when managing and optimizing my investment portfolio. Definitely check them out. They are a fantastic Canadian company. And you can get your free account by going to Build Wealth Canada dot ca slash free again that's build wealth canada dot ca slash free thanks for listening to the build wealth canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca 